Linotype for about uh, seven years or maybe six because I took a year off in the middle of my time there to go and do an MA in type design at the University of Reading. Um, and uh, just uh, in my second and a half or third year at uh, Linotype, the company was acquired by Monotype, so I also worked with Monotype sort of indirectly, Linotype and uh, Monotype's uh, sort of um, direct uh, uh, collaboration uh, happened uh, more and more uh, after I left, I think. So I have a timeline here about the project that I've been working on for far too long. Uh, I left uh, Linotype uh, to start it, and uh, I prepared uh, this um, presentation in isolation, and I've been talking with some of the other speakers and attendees about it over the last uh, 24 hours, and it slowly dawned on me that it's probably far too uh, uh, nerdy uh, for today. Uh, so I apologize for that, but only a little, because the whole reason that I left uh, uh, Linotype and Monotype was that I didn't want to manage projects. I wanted to do things that I was interested in, and I'm interested in uh, diving into type history in levels of detail that few other people care about. Um, so <laughs> there you go. Um, so I'm working on a doctorate in Braunschweig in, in Germany, and at last year's A-Type-I conference, I uh, gave a talk about some of the things that I've been kicking around in my writing, uh, and I've, I haven't repeated most of those things today. Uh, if you're really interested uh, in, in this topic, uh, uh, despite everything that I throw at you in the next 40 minutes, then go watch that video uh, online on YouTube, and you can get even uh, more details about that, uh, particularly how uh, photography was used in uh, punch cutting at the end of the 19th century. Uh, I have a lot of image captions on my slides, and I don't know how well uh, you'll be able to read them, uh, but I'm happy to share any of that information with you. You can photograph it directly or just ask for it. So, if you were to add up all of the type foundries that operated at one point or another in Germany during the 19th century, you'd come up with over 100 firms. Some of these were already very old when the 19th century began, while others only lasted for a brief time. <coughs> and uh, many of the punch cutting businesses were started either by, type, uh, by uh, punch cutters or by punch cutters who were working in collaboration with other craftsmen, like uh, uh, typecasters. Occasionally, they would also join together with uh, printers or financial investors who were not from printing or just people who loved trying to sell things. Uh, the slide behind me mentions just four uh, examples of um, punch cutter founded type foundries. Several type foundry company names were associated directly with a particular punch cutter. During those businesses' earliest years in operation, most of the typefaces that the type foundry sold uh, were cut by the punch cutters who had started the firm. Uh, this is especially true for the four companies that I have on this slide. Um, and uh, it was the, the case often that after uh, the men who had founded these companies would die or uh, retire, uh, that the people who then ran the business would retain the original names. It wasn't always the case, but it did happen a lot, uh, even after management would go to a different family. So for instance, the Bauer type foundry of Frankfurt, uh, this foundry here, uh, passed into the ownership of the Hartman family around 1900. And the Hartman family still owned Bauer's successor business, which is Newfield Digital in Barcelona. Uh, but they never renamed the company uh, the, the Hartman type foundry. So these uh, advertisements and uh, the four that I have on the next slide were all printed in either 1913 or 1914. So just at the very end of uh, my period of research. This was, of course, just before the outbreak of the First World War. But in 1914, uh, before the shooting started, there were two high-profile design exhibitions in Germany. One was the International Book Arts Fair in Leipzig, and the other one was the Werkbund exhibition in Cologne. German type foundries were not the prime movers behind either of those exhibitions, but they did participate in both of them. Uh, by 1914, type foundry advertisements looked like this. Uh, they, uh, they featured often the names of the product's designers 
uh, in print. It was a very new thing in 1913 and 1914. It hadn't happened at all before 1900, even though German type foundries had been collaborating with external freelance designers since at least the 1880s. So I made sure to include, this is a joke for the German speakers, I'm sorry, but I made sure to include an ad here for the uh, Wink Cursive it's on the bottom right. Uh, and this is for everyone who thinks that the Bauer type foundry invented the slogan, Die Schrift unserer Zeit, uh, meaning uh, the typeface of our time for Futura in 1947. They used it for lots and lots of typefaces and we only remember it uh, with Futura. So throughout the next half an hour, I'm going to passively refer to this timeline a lot. Uh, the period of, of German history that I've chosen to research begins in 1871 with national unification. Uh, and I, I realize that's somewhat arbitrary. Otherwise, it doesn't refer to any changes in the design or technology, but to politics. And I stop in 1914 when the First World War starts. Uh, by 1914, as I just mentioned, you already see type foundries advertising in a designer-centric uh, manner. Uh, they're pimping their designers. Um, and uh, yeah. I, uh, I wanted to uh, include something geographically uh, closer uh, to Faenza in my timeline. So I have Jean Battista Bodoni's uh, uh, years where he lived and worked in Parma uh, in relation uh, to everything else. You can see just how long uh, uh, he, uh, he spent there. Back in Bodoni's period, of course, as well as the centuries between the invention of printing and when uh, Bodoni was born, uh, there were differences between punch cutting, type founding, and printing as areas of manufacture and commerce. So letterpress printing was more or less the dominant form of printing for about 500 years. And throughout this time, you could almost always find independent punch cutters, which were people who would cut punches for new uh, typefaces. But these independent punch cutters didn't work uh, in environments where the type was cast on the premises. Then uh, there were punch cutters who worked inside of type foundries or inside of uh, printing houses. Uh, but there were also type foundries that only cast type uh, uh, that was uh, cut elsewhere, that did not create anything new uh, in-house. So type foundries without punch cutters. Uh, and then there were also printing houses where uh, Books weren't just printed, but also new type uh, was made in-house for those books. And uh, Bodoni's office in Parma is an excellent example of that. Uh, Bodoni made uh, the typefaces that were used uh, in the books that came from his press. So uh, um, Mariana just uh, uh, talked about this, uh, but before the 1830s, the way that most new typefaces were made involved a punch cutter or an engraver cutting uh, a letter uh, onto one end of a steel bar in actual size, and then that punch would be struck into a piece of copper. Uh, then uh, in another step, that, uh, that piece of copper, which looks kind of misformed, would get filed down, and that's how you had the matrix. You would put that in your typecasting mold and you would cast, uh, if you are using a hand mold, you could cast a, a seemingly um, infinite number of, uh, uh, of pieces of type. Uh, from that matrix. There are still designers and crafts people who perform all of these tasks uh, today. Uh, but after the late 1830s, the master forms for many typefaces were no longer cut into steel punches, but instead were cut into softer uh, metals, uh, which some researchers call uh, patrices. And then uh, through a complex electrochemical process that I'm not going to go into, uh, matrices could be grown around these patrices. And then this matrix, which you got without hitting a piece of copper or a steel uh, punch, uh, ended up being just as good for uh, casting type. So uh, there are other methods by which new typefaces uh, were, were, were produced. Uh, for instance, you could use pantographic uh, engraving machines to either cut punches uh, or engrave uh, matrices. Those really got going in the United States during the 1880s, but those methods didn't really get uh, to uh, take over the, the type-making market in Germany until after the First World War, so I'm not going to show any examples of them today. So uh, as you know, 
uh, Jean-Baptiste Bedoni ran a, I'll let, is too pixelated, I'm sorry, uh, ran a uh, Ducal printing house. That's not Bedoni, that's uh, uh, Justus Eric uh, Walbaum. And uh, he's most well known for the modern style of uh, Roman typefaces that he cut in Weimar. Now some designers group his typefaces together with Bedoni's stylistically, but Walbaum cut uh, many kinds of type, and while his punch cutting output was not as uh, 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 prolific as uh, Bedoni's, he uh, did concentrate entirely on cutting punches and uh, selling uh, uh, fonts of type. He was not a, a printer. So uh, Walbaum and his, uh, Justus Eric Walbaum and his son Theodor uh, uh, cut punches, uh, cast fonts, sold uh, those uh, fonts of type uh, to printers, but they also sold duplicate matrices of their uh, typefaces to other type foundries. So during Walbaum's lifetime, and indeed for several hundred years, it was very common for the same typefaces to be for sale from multiple type foundries. So Walbaum, for instance, would especially sell uh, uh, copies of, uh, of his matrices to other type foundries in Germany that were quite far away from Weimar. Uh, type is very heavy and while Balbaum was alive, there weren't really any railroads yet, uh, so uh, you know it wouldn't be possible for him to sell uh, uh, his type easily uh, to all uh, printers in German-speaking territories. So uh, even uh, for a couple of decades after Balbaum died, it was still common for uh, type foundries to really have uh, many of the same products across their respective catalogs. Bodoni, uh, for example, also occasionally sold matrices of his uh, typefaces. So the portrait uh, on the right is of Louis Hull, who may be the most well-regarded German punch cutter of the first half of the 20th century. So he wasn't a printer like Bedoni, and he did not have his own type foundry like Falbaum. Uh, instead, he worked as a craftsman inside of other type foundries. During the last three decades of his life and career, he ran the punch cutting departments, uh, first at the Flinch foundry in Frankfurt, and then at Bauer, also in Frankfurt. And uh, both of those companies Companies had several hundred employees, so they were much larger operations than the type foundries that would have existed in Bedoni or Walbaum's times. Now, I, uh, I will need to do a bit of penance uh, later uh, for this chart's simplification. Uh, so far, only Indra has seen this chart, and she didn't comment on it, but she did laugh at it. Uh, what I'm trying to illustrate uh, with the chart is the changing environment in which a typeface's design gets realized. So in my left host column here, I hope that it's, uh, that it's clear that the punch cutter uh, is a person who's performing a designing role in his work. But I don't call him a designer uh, because designers are really a professional class of individuals who, uh, who arose later. So designers, as we use the term today, uh, originated as a professional group of men and women who created drawings of things that other people would then execute. Uh, so the division between drawing and manufacturing also happened in uh, type foundries, and I've illustrated that in these two columns here. You have people who are drawing uh, designs uh, first, and then those designs are produced as typefaces by other uh, individuals. Uh, after the advent of desktop publishing, and uh, font editing software in the 1980s, it became possible for type designers to realize their own products without a type foundry or some sort of machinery needed to produce uh, typefaces as uh, three-dimensional products. I'm counting phototype and letter set sheets as three-dimensional products. Uh, even after type uh, casting became industrialized in this very light blue period here, there were still a few designing punch cutters who either owned or co-owned type foundries. So by this I mean they created the designs for typefaces and then they cut those designs themselves and then they sold the products through their company on the open market. The best example of this that I can think of is Friedrich Wilhelm Bauer who co-founded the Bauer and Company type foundry in Stuttgart. Uh, Friedrich Wilhelm was the son of Johann Christian Bauer uh, who had founded the uh, Bauer type foundry in Frankfurt in the 1830s. That stayed in business until 1972, that uh, 
longer lasting of the Bauer type foundries. And uh, when uh, Friedrich Wilhelm was a young man, he worked first in his uh, father's foundry before he started his own business. So uh, both uh, the father and son Bauer were uh, punch cutters, but they were also type founders and business owners. So the final versions of uh, uh, the Ekman typeface that I've reproduced here at the top of the screen and the Barron's typeface that I've reproduced at the bottom of the screen were produced in Offenbach, a, a tiny city in Germany along the River Main, uh, in 1900 and 1901. Uh, these typefaces, the way you see them in print, look very different from the master drawings that were prepared by Otto Ekman and Peter Behrens, uh, respectively. Uh, at least if you go by the drawings that are in the Klingspor Museum's collection today. Both of those typefaces were cut by Louis Hull. So either Ekman and Behrens created additional drawings that have since become lost, or the changes between the drawings and the final typefaces were made by Hull himself. And I think that this is a very important question. Uh, so the history that we have today about these typefaces and all the other typefaces like them from the time devote most of their word counts to a description of the designer's design and the designer's relationships with the type foundries who made and sold those products. Uh, I mean, the magazine articles that have been published over the last 120 years, the books that have been published over the last 120 years, websites from the last 20 years or so. The information of these, uh, that these histories give is not necessarily wrong, but I don't find it detailed enough to be satisfying. Digital font files include one field in their uh, in their tables for the name of the font's designer. They include another field for the font designer's own website. They have a third field for the website of the font's vendor. And there's a fourth field that can contain a descriptive text about the font. And uh, that field is, yeah, is either blank or whatever the font producer feels like putting in that field then goes in there. I'm not proposing that in uh, the digital versions of Ekman, for instance, that uh, Otto Ekman's name be replaced by some combination of Ekman and Hull. But online and in print, I would like to see more nuanced descriptions. Uh, Ekman is a case where an additional line of attribution for something like, uh, like an art director uh, seems particularly necessary to me. So without uh, Karl Klingspor, um, who, uh, who, who was one of the uh, uh, co-owners of the type foundry at the time, there never would have been an Ekman typeface. Um, uh, he was the one who commissioned the, the design from uh, Otto Ekman, and then he personally shepherded it through his foundry's uh, production processes. Uh, it wasn't something that Ekman uh, designed speculatively and then uh, uh, presented to the type foundry uh, after he thought it was finished. So uh, the, the Antonio's slides this morning were set in the Halyard uh, uh, fonts. And uh, that was recently uh, published by Darden Studios. They built a, a microsite to present uh, it in detail. And the microsite's colophon has very specific credits, which describe uh, who did what uh, in the making uh, of that uh, typeface. And I think that this is the direction that every digital font foundry and font distributor uh, should move in. There were thousands of typefaces that were produced during the 43 years that I'm researching. Uh, and at conferences like this one, I keep returning to Ekman because the documentation surrounding its creation is very, very thorough. Uh, and at least comparatively, we, you know, we, we know a lot about how it was made. Uh, so it makes an interesting point of reference, uh, 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 I believe. And it's also a typeface that most designers who are interested in uh, uh, type founding history around this time have heard of. And that puts it in stark contrast with the other typefaces that I'm investigating. So this is Middleine, which will probably have more pages of my dissertation devoted to it than any other typeface will. <laughs> 
Mytilene is probably the first typeface that was ever named after its designer. It was sold uh, to and, and copied by type foundries across Europe and the United States, some of whom distributed it under different names for a half century. A very little detail has been published about this typeface yet, and I'm not sure how I'm going to make anyone care about it. Uh, that is until I tell you that it might have been cut by Ferdinand Tienhardt. So we're likely never going to rediscover the exact date when Mytilene's punches were cut. Some sources suggest the year uh, 1947, but I think that's a little too early. Uh, and uh, Teinhardt left Hainel's foundry uh, in 1849 to start his own business. So I think he probably wasn't uh, involved with Mytilene. However, the chances that he cut Mytilene are much higher than the likelihood of his being behind Accidents Grotesque. I think that the broadening of a circle of attributions for historical typefaces is possible. And the best example for why I believe that is because of what happened with Helvetica 10 years ago. So uh, 10 years ago, the book Helvetica Forever was published and Gary Hustwitz's documentary film also premiered ab about the typeface called Helvetica. Uh, both of these brought Haas's director, Eduard Hoffman, into the foreground of the narrative regarding the design of Neue Haas Grotesque. And this was really excellent. Um, I mean, if you go to linotype.com today, the website still states that uh, Helvetica was designed by the Linotype Design Studio and Max Meininger. Um, some things never change. When I was in high school, we were taught about the unifications of Italy uh, in, in Germany uh, in our European history classes. And uh, I haven't investigated what national unification meant for Italian industry uh, or Italian type bounding. However, in Germany, unification helped bring about agreement on industrial standards uh, in the country's type foundries. Before 1871, Germany was not a single country, but uh, indeed several neighboring German-speaking territories in Central Europe, and that's without even talking about Austria and Switzerland. In uh, 1871, the new German National Parliament adopted the meter as a standard unit of measurement. Before that, there were over 100 competing standards for measuring length in uh, the German territories. Uh, so good. Uh, the, the metric system helped, uh, but in uh, a, a year later, German type foundries came together and th they agreed that going forward they would delineate their type in Didot points. So Didot points came from France, uh, but they were based on the old French foot. Uh, th they weren't metric. Uh, and this was a problem uh, because after 1873, it turned out the German type foundries were each interpreting the exact size of a Dito point differently. The type foundries in Berlin turned to Hermann Berthold for help. Now, Berthold's company eventually became one of the largest type foundries in the world. But in the 1870s, they didn't make type yet. Uh, instead, they manufactured brass rules for printers. You know, the stuff that you use to separate your lines of type. Uh, uh, or if you need to print uh, lines, or if you have like these flourishing, swirly ornaments that were particularly you know, popular in the late 19th century, you need a high level of industrial precision to make those things. And so Berthold was operating at a higher level than type boundaries were. So uh, he made the official measuring stick, uh, which you've, you can see here. It was 30 centimeters long, and it was divided up into exactly 798 points. And now everyone could make sure that their points were actually the same size. There are other kinds of points, too. The points that are used in Britain and in the United States are not Dito points. They're a different measurement. And today we have desktop publishing points, which are neither Anglo-American points nor the Dito point. But for the remaining few minutes, I'm up here on stage. Whenever I say points, I mean Dito points. Uh, now, uh, that the Germans had finally decided that they were going to use Dito points as a standard of measurement, they decided to standardize other things. And the next item on the list was height to paper. So that's how tall your uh, uh, pieces of type actually are. 
There was a big problem in the 1870s regarding height of paper. Uh, in 1871, there were eight type foundries operating in Berlin uh, alone. And uh, these eight type foundries used at least four different height to paper measurements. So that meant that you could not combine fonts from most type foundries on the press at the same time because they would have slightly different heights. Uh, one foundry's type would be a little bit higher or a little bit uh, lower and uh, you wouldn't get an even impression from them. Uh, uh, and printers were upset about this, naturally. So, but if you've ever worked with German engineers in a corporate environment, you're going to understand this dilemma. Type founders were not off-put by this lack of a common height because, well, uh, you could uh, make sure that the people who already bought type from you were locked into your system forever. Uh, the common height to paper measurement was not a new idea. In France, they had already basically established a standard height to paper measurement in 1723. Uh, but, you know, uh, uh, it had not been standardized uh, 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 in Germany over the next uh, 150 years or so. Uh, German type founders agreed on 62 and two-thirds uh, uh, of a point for their height to paper measurement uh, in the 1870s, and that's still a German standard today. Uh, it was basically what they were using uh, in France, except that the, the, the Parisian type foundries at the time actually ranged slightly between 62 and a third points and 63 points, so the Germans took an average of what the French were making. Um, the thing is that the economic odds at the time were just not in the anti-standards camp's favor. German reunification had removed all of the inner German tariffs and the railroads were on their way to connecting everything. So Germany was a very big market. If you had a printing office all the way over here in the east, in East Prussia, or down here in Silesia, uh, you uh, had 70 domestic uh, type foundries who all wanted to sell you type. Uh, and newer printing offices were literally opening up all over the place. Literally, seat lates were uh, increasing, uh, and people's uh, disposable incomes were going up too. So the arguments for standardization uh, were just too strong. Uh, you would make more money that way. So there's one final standard that I want to discuss uh, uh, today, and it's about where to put the baseline exactly on the face of the letter. So where this dotted red line falls. If you look at monotype Plantin uh, in its hot metal uh, uh, existence from uh, 1913, you can see that its smallest sizes, so 5.5 point, uh, had really, really short descenders. Now monotype did this so that you could get lines of type, you could really squish them together and you could put a lot of type on the page. Uh, German typefaces also had short uh, descenders, but their shortness was not caused by this reason of economics. Now, I'm going to take a step back. Today, with digital typesetting, it is self-evident that no matter what you do as a type user, your letters are going to share a common baseline. If you switch your font midline, the, the letters from the new font are going to have the same baseline as the letters from the old font, unless you're font has a bug in it or is some kind of weird grunge design. If you make your font size bigger, the letters from each size are going to sit on the same baseline too. It took 450 years from the invention of printing until the arrival of a common baseline as an industrial standard anywhere. And we're all hoping for a quick adaptation of variable fonts. Um, so what's the deal about a common baseline? Uh, this sample is a bit of contrived type foundry marketing. Of course, no one would have ever set this. Um, but it makes a good point. Uh, this silly sample of text has 33 different typefaces. Uh, and they don't have a common baseline. The combinations of some lines just look terrible. This is actually from London. It's a Spanish language edition of Haddon's type catalog. But the pages that explain the standard baseline are in German. The idea for a standard baseline comes from the United States. Uh, it had been introduced in the early 1890s by the Inland Type Foundry, uh, 
they like to think of themselves as the original ITF. Um, and uh, the, the, the son of the owner of Genshin Heise, a type foundry in Hamburg, uh, had worked at Inland uh, for about a year uh, in uh, 1898. Uh, so he got to know the standard line and he thought it was a great idea. He came back to Germany and told his dad all about it. And in 1903, they decided that they were going to institute a standard baseline in their own foundry. But this wasn't enough for Genshin Heise. They wanted to make all of the other German type foundries adopt it as a national norm too. And that happened in 1905. So the idea of a standard baseline, as I mentioned a moment ago, it allowed fonts of multiple designs, like you can see here, to be combined on a same baseline. Uh, or, or the letters will be on the same line uh, when they're printed. But it, uh, it, and it allowed you to, uh, to mix fonts from multiple foundries so they would also align nicely. But you could also, and this was probably even more important, you could combine different sized fonts and have them print on the same line. Now, why I explained the whole thing about the dough points 10 minutes ago. By 1905, all German type and spacing material was delineated in commonly understood Dido points. So if you wanted to mix 9-point type and 12-point type on a line, you would put one point of spacing material below the 9-point type and two points of spacing material on top of the 9-point type. You then had this block of type pieces that was 12 points in height. And the baseline of the nine point type with one point of spacing material underneath of it would perfectly align with 12 point type. In Italy and in the European countries where Roman type became the dominant face of printing, uh, there was one ideal in terms of perfection in letter forms. And in Germany there was another. When Genge and Heise developed their standard German baseline in the beginning of the 20th century, uh, and for the next few decades after that, more than half of all printed material in Germany was still set in black letter type. Printers wanted to be able to easily mix black letter and Roman type on the same line. While Roman typefaces allowed for uh, a senders and, and D senders, generally speaking, to have a generous amount of space. Uh, a senders and D senders play a much less significant role in black letter designs. Unlike with digital fonts today, the standard baseline in metal type fell at different vertical measurements depending on what point size you were looking at. So in the sample above, seven sizes of Stempel Garamond have been resized so that the letters all have the same X height. And if you look at the descender of the 60-point P and compare it with the descender of the 28-point uh, 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 Q, you can see that this is a much longer descender than that. Uh, so here's the chart. Uh, you can see right here that... Uh, the three sizes of type 7 point, 8 point, and 9 point all have descenders of the same real length. So a descender that looks pretty good on a 7 point piece of type is going to look rather less good in 9 point type. And of course I have some images coming up. Uh, my, my upcoming images are all in Gensh Antiqua. Uh, Gensh and Heise produced this typeface a few years after they instituted their standard line. Uh, uh, originally called Nordische Antiqua, or Northern Roman, as in Northern Europe, as in all Scandinavian type uh, uh, comes from us, uh, we uh, own you, um, uh, was designed by uh, uh, Friedrich Bauer, who ran the printing unit uh, at uh, Genshin Heise. At the time, uh, printing units inside German type foundries were, were basically like marketing departments are today. Uh, they created all the specimen, the catalogs, the advertisements, any specialty books or publications or uh, ephemera that were going to uh, be published, they uh, designed and made in-house. Uh, 
And uh, in addition to running the printing unit and designing typefaces, Friedrich Bauer was one of the most prolific authors on typographic uh, uh, themes and type history subjects of his generation uh, in Germany. It would be fair to describe him as the German Updike or the German Morrison. Uh, but uh, he's less well known than Updike or Stanley Morrison because those guys wrote in English and Bauer's works were never translated out of German. So unfortunately, I don't know who cut Gensch Antiqua. Uh, I, I have a list that I've reproduced here of all the employees from the punch cutting and engraving department uh, at the type foundry. That was printed in uh, 1908, so just after Gensch and Hazen was produced. But the list doesn't tell me if all of these people were actually employed at the foundry in 1906. Um, and that's especially true for the, uh, for the apprentices, uh, kind of like interns today, um, who really could have been new hires to the firm in 1908. So here I have eight Gs from Gensch Antiqua uh, from the six through 36 points and I've resized them so that they all have the same X height. Uh, the red dotted line is the uh, baseline, so everything above uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the baseline is this X height zone. And the nine point and the 24 point Gs look particularly fishy, I think. Uh, you can see, if you look at all of these uh, uh, cheese, that uh, the, the horizontal stroke at the top of the lower part of the, the G, this moves up and down in relation to the baseline all the time. Sometimes it's uh, uh, totally above uh, the baseline, and sometimes it's almost totally below the baseline. Uh, and here are the eight and the nine point uh, Gs, again, uh, reproduced in their actual relationship that they had uh, with one another. So, uh, and the descenders had the same real size, uh, 1.9 uh, uh, points. So it's only the space above the baseline uh, that grew as you went from uh, this size to that size in terms of the available space it had to live in. So as I mentioned before, uh, Friedrich Bauer worked at Gensch and Hase while Gensch Antiqua was in production. Uh, uh, a few years later, he wrote an article describing generally how typefaces were produced. Uh, um, and he explicitly stated in that article that designers submitted one set of drawings to the type foundries for their new typefaces. And this is true at the time, at least. That would be one big sheet uh, with all the uppercase and the lowercase letters, plus numbers and punctuation. Uh, he went on in his article to describe that it was the punch cutters who were responsible for making the necessary size-specific adjustments to those designs. So this certainly implies that uh, it would have been a punch cutter who reinterpreted all of these different kinds of uh, Gs, and not that uh, uh, that Bauer uh, uh, looked at all of these possible sizes and made that many different drawings of a G. So to date, I've only found one mention of a freelance German type designer who prepared drawings for multiple sizes of a typeface. Uh, and that mention occurs in an article published uh, 32 years after Bauer's article. It was in a 1942 article about uh, Emil Rudolf Weiss, published a few days after Weiss had died. And it probably describes the type design from the early 1920s. So while all of this is going on, uh, in my period of research, uh, designers aren't thinking about size-specific uh, changes. Most of the typefaces produced in German type foundries between about 1900 and 1914 were designed by external freelance designers. They did not arise in situations like uh, Gensch Antiqua did, where the designer and the punch cutters worked for the same company, probably in the same building, and may have even known each other very well and like hung out and stuff. Uh, we can easily imagine that Bauer could have had a collegial relationship with the uh, punch cutters at Genshin Heise. He also came from a craftsman background. Uh, he didn't go to university or study art or something like that. Um, and uh, so he might have even been in a position where he could have given them concrete feedback that they would have accepted while the typeface was uh, in progress. 
while each freelance type designer uh, working at this time, there were about two to three dozen, depending on how you want to count them, uh, uh, were involved in some sort of back and forth uh, with their type foundries uh, about how uh, designs would be approved. Uh, it's hardly likely that they would have been able to exert the same kind of influence on their unfolding designs as someone who worked in-house could have. German type foundries during the hot metal, during the metal type era, the cold metal type era, during the metal type era, did not standardize their typefaces whiffs the way that it was necessary for monotype to do. So monotype worked with an 18 unit grid system. Some letters had five units to live in, others maybe 10 or 12 or 18, and I'm skipping over the details of this, but uh, designs only had so many available possible instances of a width available. So you could only have so many be 12 units wide, so many 13 units wide, et cetera, which means that a designer's design sometimes had to have letters adapted uh, to fit uh, the system's requirements. And that infuriated some people. No one was more infuriated than Jan van Krimpen, at least uh, if we go by the printed record. Uh, it's worth mentioning that uh, Van Krimpen could have adapted some or all of his type designs to monotypes restrictions himself if he would have been willing to get his hands dirty and do the work himself. But he didn't. Uh, so um, it's possible that, like Van Krimpen, there were German type designers either in the decade before the First World War or the decades after the First World War who got riled up by the requirements of the standard baseline, but I have not run across any evidence of that. Thanks to Jan Mindorp, uh, we know that De Roos and Hartz, two designers in the Netherlands, did express criticism of the standard uh, German baseline. And while I get a kick out of the idea that the only people who complain about standards in industrial type production are Dutch, um, uh, I, I think it's important to look at the, uh, the professional context in which De Roos and Hartz and also Van Krimpen worked. So like Bauer, uh, they worked inside of corporate environments that included type founding as one of the activities that, that happened. De Roos worked at the Type Foundry Amsterdam and Hartz worked at Enschede in Harlem, just like uh, Jan van Krimpen. Uh, so they were each able to accompany their typefaces to a higher degree uh, than would have been possible for the German type designers who were working as freelancers. They were on the inside rather than on the outside. Um, at least that's the case for these Dutch, type uh, Dutch typefaces that were produced uh, uh, in the Dutch type foundries. The, the, type fa the typefaces that uh, were made by linotype or monotype that Van Krimpen complained about, of course, uh, that's a bit different. So I want to close now with this comment of Walter Tracy's. Why didn't Tracy like German Romans? Uh, I can only speculate, but I have uh, three suspicions. Uh, first, German Romans were less historicist than the Romans created by uh, monotype and linotype in Britain and the United States at the same time. By this, I mean less of them were strict revivals of older typefaces. Second, uh, the German Romans were not always created as part of larger type foundries. Uh, by this, I mean they didn't come necessarily with multiple weights. Um, and it was also uh, not so likely that they would always have italics that were released at the same time as the Romans. The italics often came later and were presented in specimen as typefaces to be used independently, uh, where you would set a whole text in an italic, and not as a where uh, italic is a secondary typeface where you just have a few words in a Roman text set in italic, uh, the way that was more common in uh, uh, English-speaking countries. Um, German black letters also very rarely came in families, and when they did, multiple weights uh, were more common uh, than having an upright and uh, cursive uh, style design. So the third reason for Tracy's assessment here may well have been the design of uh, the descenders in certain uh, point sizes, but not in all of them. Well, I think I'm finished uh, now. Um, uh, these are the conclusions that I wanted to uh, arrive at, and I think that I've touched uh, uh, on all these points. 
uh, please come find me later today if uh, you want to argue about the division of labor and credit uh, between type designers and type makers in the industrial era. It would be great. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.